We are going to begin talking about chapter 12 and dealing with capital investments. All, all along we've been discussing uh, managerial accounting and the processing portion. Well, you need money to make money, don't you? And so we're going to spend this chapter, or, or this session today only, discussing chapter 12, going over some of the problems on chapter 12, okay? We, be, we talked about a capital budget, and the <coughs> let's begin talking about this capital budgeting process. Actually, let me back up here. When, when we know we need capital investments, we need to plan for them. And so part of this budgeting process is really planning out um, ahead of time for them, needing the cash flow in order to um, plan for them, determining based on several scenarios what our payback time is going to be, and then from there determining um, the benefit of those investments from a couple different scenarios we're going to talk about. We're only going to go cover on the test what we talk about in class here. So when we're dealing with this authorization process for p potential capital budgeting, we're going to get proposals and they're going to be this big budget committee that's going to determine um, what is needed and which ones are ultimately going to be funded. And then the board of directors really is the one that ultimately approves those um, uh, capital improvements. Um, proposal pro for projects are requested from various departments. They're screened by a committee. The um, t head management team determines which ones are uh, necessary or needed. And then from there, the board of directors needs to approve those um, expansions. Now, cash flow. For purposes of this capital budgeting, estimated cash flows, be it inflows and outflows, are um, necessary. Ultimately, the value of all financial investments is determined by the value of cash flows received and cash flows paid. So is this capital budgeting plan going to ultimately be in the best interest of the company? So for example, as we're looking at flows, um, cash outflows are going to be the money to get the capital project going, any repairs, operating cost as a result of it, and inflows are going to be selling the old equipment, increased cash that's coming in from customers, and um, the outflows that were previously happening, but the ones that are getting reduced because of the new equipment, and then also the salvage value of the old equipment. So we need to really look at our cash as it relates to this big expansion picture. Capital budgeting dependent decisions ultimately are going to be influenced by the money available, various relationships among these various projects that are proposed, the company's basic decision-making approach, and then any risk associated with a particular project. So there's a lot of need, but there's only so much available in order to do that. Stewardshipping companies considering an investment of 130,000 in new equipment. So 130,000 is the um, initial investment. They expect it to last for 10 years. And then as a result, they figure out the inflows from customers, the outflows from operating costs to come up with this annual cash flow, positive or negative. So as we determine here what's called the cash payback, this, this method helps identify the time period that we're going to recover our $130,000. So we're going to take our $130,000, Divide that by our 24,000 net cash increase to determine the payback period in years is 5.42 years. It's got a useful life of 10 years. That's not too bad. The shorter payback period is generally going to be more attractive. Why? You recoup the cost much quicker. Um, sometimes cash flow isn't uh, on a continuum. 
sometimes it's going to be on a cyclical or a um, not a direct relationship so basically when there's uneven cash flows the company has to determine the payback method when the cumulative net cash flow from the investment ultimately equals the cost of the investment that makes sense that's real a straightforward simple approach cumulative cash flows equal the investment Chen company proposes an investment in a new website it estimates to cost 300,000 cash payback should not be the only basis for capital budgeting um, decisions since it ignores profitability so as you can see here we're showing our various cash flows and where we know when the paybacks gonna happen do you see here we'll get our cash flows back in roughly year three and a half okay let's look at this example water town paper corp is considering adding another machine for the manufacture of corrugated cardboard the machine would cost nine hundred thousand dollars have an estimated life of six years without any salvage value the company estimates that annual cash inflows would increase by four hundred thousand and that annual cash outflows would increase by one hundred ninety thousand we have to compute the cash payback period what are we going to do first 400 minus the 190 gives us our 210 we're going to take what we have to purchase the equipment for divided it by the 210 means we'll get our cash payback in 4.3 years out of a six-year estimated useful life a hundred thousand dollar investment with zero salvage has an eight-year life Compute the payback period in, if straight line depreciation is used and net income is determined to be 20000 So basically, let me see here. Eight, so it's got an eight-year useful life. So basically, they're showing the cash outflow to be 100000 divided by eight is going to be... Well, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm a little confused on that one. Um, we're going to basically use net present value to determine the value of that money today in today's standards. Um, there's an internal rate of return approach, and then there's the net present value approach. So this net present value approach is where we take all these cash monies coming in, and we discount them back to today's money and we take the capital outlay which is usually today's money anyway and we come up with an interest rate to determine this and if the net present value is zero or positive then it's going to be a good sign but if the higher the net present value the more appealing it is if that net present value is a negative probably not a good investment strategy okay because we're not going to get the return back so the proposal gets accepted or is doable when the present value is either a positive sign or at least zero so the present value of your cash flows minus what we're investing in it comes up with a, a net present value and we know which side of the equation based if it's going to be an acceptable process here Stewart Shipping Company's annual cash flows are 24000 If we assume this amount is uniform over the asset's useful life, we can compute the present value of the net annual cash flows. So we go in and don't worry about discount. Um, the, the numbers, uh, those will be provided for you if we have a test where you're not given that. They'll be provided for you. So we come up with the discount factor for 10 years, a period of 10 years at 12%. We take the 24,000 present value times over 10 periods means that money, the present value of that money today is 135,000. Okay, do you see how that works? Got it? Guys, and 
like a dummy, I couldn't remember what they were doing. What we're doing here is an investment of 100,000 with an eight year life. What is 100,000 divided by eight years? It's about 12, five? 12,500. If you take this net income of 20,000 plus the 12,5, which is 35,5, it's going to take 3.8 years to get that $100,000 back. And the way they calculate that is 100,000 divided by 35,5. Okay? Because the cash um, outflow is really the 20,000 plus the depreciation because really that depreciation is just, um, it's, a, it's an adjusted journal entry, but the, the true cash is going to be greater than this 20000 Does that make sense, what I'm telling you? <coughs> okay. Okay, so the present value of net cash flows, which we got of 135 minus what the capital investment is going to be, gives us our net present value. So the expenditure is going to be acceptable because this is zero or greater than zero, isn't it? <coughs> now, here's another example where Stuart Shipping expects the same total net cash flow of 240 over the life of the investment, but since it's a declining market, the net annual cash flows are going to be real high in the early years and lower in later years. So as you can see here, we're going to have to discount them um, based on the number of years, um, the discount factor, uh, present value of the amount coming in in year 10 versus the present value of the amount coming in in year 3. We would use a different chart for this because all these numbers aren't all the same. They're all different. So here we come up with the present value of this money today. See, it's 144367 That's definitely more favorable, isn't it? Because we're receiving more of that money in earlier periods. How do you choose a discount rate? It's often that companies require a certain rate of return, which basically is the rate that it's going to pay to borrow the money. So usually it's the risk and it's the cost of capital to borrow money. So you've got to come up with a discount rate in order to determine the present value. Stewart Shipping used a discount rate of 12%. Let's say this rate does not take into account the risk of a project. So if we're just taking into account the rate to borrow money, we're not taking into account potential risk we might have. So that might need to be increased because what if the, the, the potential project bombs? So as you can see here, look what happens when our discount rate changes. Here, the present value of different discount rates at 12%, it's a favorable project. If we're dealing with 15%, it's not quite the favorable project we once thought. So as the discount rate goes up, you know, the, the cost of um, implementing this project is also going to go up. Now, we can make certain assumptions we keep really simple to make our job easier. Instead of trying to figure out that the cash flows are happening you know, throughout the year, we can make assumptions they're all going to happen at the end of the year and that they always get right reinvested into something else and they're real predicted. Well, we know that's not reality, do we? But that's how we're going to use certain examples in order to determine this rate of return. Compute the net present value of a $260,000 investment with a 10-year life, annual cash flows of $50,000, and a discount rate of 12%. So how would we calculate this, guys? So we'd have to come up with our table, our factor table. But basically, uh, the 260000 we would have to look at the present value of an annuity for 10 years at a 12% rate. Do you know what I'm saying? Come up with that figure, subtract it from our $260,000 investment, 
And my guess is that number is 282,511. You see what I'm saying? Does anyone have your book where we can come up with the um, present value of um, a 10-year annuity at a 12% interest rate? So you go to the chart for present value of an annuity and I should, let me try to find this here. Let's try to find this. What page are the annuity charts on? Does anyone know? Fifty-three. Oh, no, that's an. I'm looking for the present value table here. Let me just find. Um, present value of an annuity table. Appendix A6. So what page is that? Uh, probably A6. Okay. Now that's a future value. We want the present value. Okay. Present value of, okay. So if we take 10 periods, and is was that a 12% interest rate we were looking at? Yeah. So we should be able to take um, 0.32197. So if we took, the 500,000 times 0.32197, what is it? Oh, wait, it's more than 500. 260 with an investment life of 10 years. Um, okay, what's 500,000 times 0.32? No, that's not right. So we need to take our 500,000 plus our 260,000. So let's take our 760 times that 0.32. What do we get then? No, times 500. Because we have an annual cash flow each year of 50. 760 times 0.32 is what? Seven sixty times point three two. Okay, we're I'm. You know what? I, we got to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Let's we'll keep going and see where I'm at. Okay, because obviously I'm I'm using the wrong the factor. You know, it should be an annuity. Unless I'm, shouldn't be an annuity due, it should be an annuity. Okay, let's look at these. Let's check this one out, they'll tell us. Watertown Papers considering adding another machine. It's gonna cost 900,000, have an estimated life of six years, no salvage value. Cash flows are gonna increase by 400,000 and annual, I'm gonna wait till y'all are done talking because it's hard to talk over you. Annual cash outflows would increase by 190. 
management has a required rate of return of 9%. So how we're going to figure this, the cash flows of 400000 the annual cash outflows give us our 210 net cash flows. We take that 210 present value of net annual cash flows times our 9% discount factor. That's where I'm getting, we're using the wrong table somewhere. To give us the present value of that of 942,043, but the project is going to cost us 900, so our net present value is 42,043. So guys, this was table four, appendix A. Which one were we using earlier? I bet we were using the wrong table. Uh, table three. If we went to use table four, present value of an annuity, that's what we would want. So if we use it was a 12% interest rate times 10 years. So, so if we take that 50,000, okay, now it's going to be 50 because this is the right table. F times 5.65022, what's our number we get? That, okay. So that would make sense. We go back here, 282.511. Do you see how that's 22,500? Um, eleven dollars greater than our investment okay so I'm sorry I screwed y'all up there um, okay so here as you can tell this is a favorable project we would accept it let's take it a little more um, involved here we are considering investing in new equipment to produce fat-free food snacks. So we're going to need a million bucks. We're going to have to spend extra money to overhaul the um, equipment. And we also have a salvage value at the end of the period, along with our discount rate of 15%. It gives us our inflows, our outflows, our costs. So basically from all this information, we've got to determine if it's um, an acceptable project we would consider. We're going to take this, come up with our inflows, our outflows, maintenance costs, direct operating costs. This gives us our annual cash flow for this machine. We're going to have to then take the million dollars, which is the present value of a million dollars is a million dollars. Our equipment overhaul we're going to have to discount it because this is this much money over five years. Our annual cash flow, we're going to determine the present value of, along with our salvage value in today's dollars. So as you can see in this example, is this an, a project we would accept or not accept? We would accept it because We've got 1,158,159 over the 1,099,000. Okay? I know the red got you. Sometimes we have to look more than just at the dollars. Sometimes we've got to look at um, intrinsic values that may enhance the company. Um, and quality isn't even an intrinsic value. Customer loyalty can be... Well, they all get played out ultimately in dollars, but um, improved safety, again, they're ultimately going to play out in dollars, but you might not see that money necessarily up front. So intangible benefits are definitely um, something that needs to be taken into account. And when we're doing it based on net present value, we're not really paying attention to those intangible benefits, are we guys? Right? So let's look at this one. Berg Company is considering the purchase of a new mechanical robot. The initial investment's $200,000. We've got our cash inflows, our cash outflows to show $30,000 over 10 years at a 12% discount rate. So we can see here our present value of those, those $30,000 is only one sixty nine. dollars 
our investment is 200 are we going to probably support this from a pure cash standpoint no unless there's other reasons to to uh, that this investment is going to bring other intangible aspects or intrinsic value to us Berg estimates that sales will increase cash flows by 10,000 annually as a result of an increase in quality. Berg also estimates that annual cost outflows could be reduced as a result of lo lower warranty claims and injury claims. So now what it's trying to do is we've got to take an extra um, 45,000 a year and put that into the factor to help determine our net present value because we believe in addition to everything else we talked about, as a result of it being a quality enhancer, it's gonna produce more sales and we're not gonna have the returns and the warranty care expense. So look what happens when we add some things into the, fact, the equation, guys. It makes it a favorable project. Um, we're not gonna worry about mutually exclusive projects here. I think what let's do, let's take some time and look at a problem. Um, you said it was like 558. I said that you got the wrong one. 571. Okay, guys, let's look at 571 here. Uh, Okay, 572. Okay, guys, so let's look at 12.1. Palo Alto Corporation is considering purchasing a new delivery truck. The truck has many advantages over the current company's current truck, not the least of which is that it runs. The new truck would cost 56000 Because of the increased capacity, reduced maintenance costs, and increased fuel economy, the truck is expected to generate cost savings of 7500 At the end of eight years, the company will sell the truck for an estimated 27000 <coughs> Traditionally, the company has used a rule of thumb that a proposal should not be accepted unless it has a payback period that is less than 50% of the assets estimated useful life. Larry Newton, a new manager, suggested that the company shouldn't rely solely on payback, but should employ the net present value method when evaluating new projects. The company's cost of capital is 8%. So what we're gonna do is compute it based on this payback period and then compute it based on the net present value um, proposed investment and determine which way does the project meet its um, criteria, okay? So let's go look here. 12.1. Look at what happens here. So if we take the 56000 and we're not even taking into account the huge um, salvage value of $27,000 we are going to get, we take this divided by $7,500, look what the payback period is, 7.5 years. Would they accept it based on that criteria? No. no. But if we take the present value criteria here and we show our cash flows of $7,500 each year times our discount um, factor of 5.74664, that is 43000 And then we come up with the present value at the end of the five years and calculate that at today's present value. That's at 14000 Look what happens. Would it be met? Would this criteria help meet this investment? So do you see how based on different criteria, it may or may not 
meet the guidelines. Okay, the next, I'll wait on that a minute, Susan. So the next um, question is, does the project meet the company's cash payback criteria? Does it? No, but it does meet the um, present value, net present value criteria. Um, because they expect it to have a payback within four years and it's not gonna happen that way. Any questions on this, guys? How are you doing? Okay. What? Yep, we're going to go over several problems. And uh, only the problems that we go over similar in class are you going to, you know, have. Doug's custom construction company is considering three new projects, each requiring an equipment investment of 22000 Each project is going to last for three years and will produce the following net annual flows. So we've got project AA, BB, and CC. Each one's going to cost them $22,000, okay? Now, do you see how some are the same amount each year? AA starts out with a lower cash outlay, or outflow, inflow, I should say, and increases. CC is a greater inflow and decreases. The equipment salvage value is zero. Doug uses straight line depreciation. Doug will not accept any project with a cash payback period over two years. Doug's required rate of return is 12%. What we're going to do here is compute each payback um, period indicating the most desirable excuse me, um, project and the least desirable project. So let's go and look at how we're going to calculate these paybacks, okay? So right here, you see in year one with AA, we've got a net annual cost of seven, okay? Now in year two, 9,000. In year three, uh, 12,000. So a total here of 28,000. If we calculate... Um, the cash payback to be two years, then that means, and it's got a, excuse me, 6,000 minus 12,000. So the 22,000 minus the 16,000 here, uh, three years, last for three years it's got zero um, okay so in this scenario given the AA net annual cash flow and how it combines here we are taking the I'm trying to figure out how they're doing that 1260 they're taking the difference between the cumulative cash flow minus the the twenty two thousand minus the sixteen thousand at the end of the period to come up with an average um, cash flow each year, dividing that by twelve thousand dollars to come up with um, fifty percent is the payback. So 22,000, for us to do it with um, AA, this cash payback period is 2.5 years. For BB, the cash payback is 2.2 years. And for CC, the cash payback is 1.75 years. 
which one is the best scenario for the payback um, for payback purposes? It's going to be B. Uh, it's going to be BB exactly for the one point seven five years, right? Uh, excuse me, CC is 1.75 years. So it's basically got the shortest payback period here. Now, if we take this AABB and CC and we do it based on the net present value um, criteria, and again, I will give you any discount factors so you don't have to worry about that. But if you look at... <clears throat> The cash flow in year one, <coughs> based on the, the um, factor in the year two, year three, you get the net present value minus your investment. This is a negative here. In BB, it's at 2,000. It's a positive, but it's at 2,000. And the CC is, again, a better investment. As you can see, the um, net present value is $7,003. It's still the most desirable project there, right? Yes, no? You got this is all online, just so you know. You'll have this all online. Okay. Um, Let's look at 12.3. 12.3 shows us Highland Inc. manufactures snowsuits. They're considering purchasing a sewing machine at a cost of $2.45 million. Its existing machine was purchased five years ago at a price of $1.8 million. Six months ago, Highland spent 55000 to keep it operational. The existing sewing machine can be sold today for 260000 The new sewing machine would require a one-time $85,000 training cost. An operating cost would decrease by the following amounts for years one through seven. So we've got a decrease in outflow expenses. Um, we've got, we know the cost of the machine um, we know what's happening with our current machine and what we can sell it for. So those are all going to relate to inflows and outflows. The new machine is going to be depreciated according to the d double declining balance method at a rate of 20%. The salvage value is expected to be 350000 This new equipment would require maintenance cost of 100000 at the end of the fifth year. So guys, they're giving us a lot of different questions here, or a, a lot of different scenarios we're having to put in here. We're going to take all this to determine the net present value. So we've got the amount the machine's going to cost, the amount our old machine was, what we're paying to keep it operational, the salvage value, our one-time training cost outlay for the new machine, <coughs> and the salvage value on our new machine. So let's look at how we're going to work this. We would need two million four hundred fifty thousand in the new new equipment. Subtract out our salvage value, or excuse me, of the old equipment. The additional training we're going to need for the new equipment, because these are all in today's current dollars. So our initial investment is really two point two seven five. We're including everything it's going to cost to get us operational, plus removing the old machine. So our cash flows, as you see here, are in the first year, 390. In the second year, 400, 411. They're changing each year, so it's not a, a static number. As a result of them changing, we're going to use different um, discount factors based on each year. So we're coming up with the all the present value of all those monies coming in and then we know at the end of year five we're gonna have to fork out five hundred thousand so we're gonna put that in there also 
And then we also get to show the present value of when we get rid of the new piece of equipment, the salvage value at the present values rates. So based on the present value of all those monies versus what our initial investment needs to be, do you think we're going to invest in it? We're not going to invest in it because all of the outlay we would need, or, or let me just say, all of our, the present value of all the money we anticipate receiving still isn't going to meet up to what it's going to cost us to get the machine. So based just on this net present value calculation, we shouldn't buy the machine. Okay? Let's go back here to the PowerPoint. I don't want to confuse you with too many things. Um, I'm just going to keep it a very simple problem for you as it relates to this chapter because I'm not going to have you look up those values in the tables. I'll provide them for you, okay? Um, now, one thing that's really important to know with all this, it's all guessing or guesstimates, isn't it? We really don't know what's going to happen. We're just trying to provide the best information based on what we've got. Um, sensitivity analysis, though, is used to deal with certain types of uncertainty. Um, let's look at this one. Widescreen capacity. Building a new factory to produce 50 or 60 inch TVs can cost in excess of $4 billion. But for more than 10 years, m manufacturers of these screens continued to build new plants. By building so many plants, they expanded the capacity at a rate that exceeded the demand for big screen TVs. During one recent year, the supply of big screen TVs was estimated to exceed demand by 12%. On one state of the art plant, built by Sharp was estimated to be operating at only 50% capacity. Experts say that the price of the big screen TVs will have to fall much further than they already have before demand will eventually catch up with productive capacity. Isn't it amazing, those big screen TVs? I remember eight years ago buying, like, for 2500 a 30 inch flat screen. And today, for 2500 you can get almost a 55 inch TV. It's a well. My husband likes these Sharp Aquios or some. You know, he's got a certain brand he likes. But it's amazing how they've gone down. Same with computers. What happened? My first computer I bought in 1987 cost me like 3,500, and it had just a little floppy drive. <laughs> you know. Um, guys, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on the internal rate of return. I think I'm just going to focus on dealing with purely the net present value and the payback period for this chapter, then internal rate of return is another way we make decisions. But I think I'm going to cut it short and keep it simple, okay? So as far as for your last quiz, final exam, slash the two are the same, on this chapter, what I really will probably focus on relate to matching, you know, what is the payback period? What is um, you know, what are the different factors you need to be aware of, okay? And then if we went over a problem in class, it's game for on the quiz, okay? Any questions? How are you guys doing? What? I am going to turn this 